Gospel of Mark, the 12th chapter. It happened at the Convair plant out in San Diego. Very large corporation, many, many employees. They were so proud of their safety record. 176 days without an accident. And then the inevitable. One lady fell, fracturing her knee. The irony, she fell over a safety first sign. <laughs> now sometimes we stumble over the very thing that is meant to help us. We begin this morning what will be a six-part series on the Ten Commandments. God meant them for our help, but sometimes we get kind of aggravated or discouraged or frustrated and feeling negative about them. Let's make it our aim as we study to find for ourselves here and now how the Ten Commandments can be not a stumbling block, but a stepping stone. Now, why was it that God gave us the Ten Commandments? What is their purpose? God just likes telling us what to do? I would like to share four reasons to preface our getting into the Ten Commandments, four reasons why I think God gave the Ten Commandments. Number one, I believe God gave us the Ten Commandments to show us what love is to make love specific. Let's read it if you have it in Mark chapter 12, verses 30 and 31. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. I'm inclined to think that most of us like these two commandments in the New Testament better than we like the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament. Jesus gave them both. Why do we like the two better? Because Jesus has become more general and gentle and liberal in the New Testament? No, I'm inclined to think that we like the two love commandments better than the ten Old Testament commandments because the ten are much more specific. You see, all of us believe in love so long as we can decide what that really looks like. I believe in love, but only if love can simply be an extension of my nature. If love can be what I decide it is, then it doesn't really inhibit me. And I can get that out of these two great commandments that we just read. Jesus says to love, and I decide what love is, and then I can love and be happy about that. But when I come to the Ten Commandments, they get too specific for me. And I don't enjoy the Ten Commandments in my own nature. They tell me too specifically what love really looks like, what it really means. You see, true love leads to changed behavior. The only way you can know that your love is genuine is when your love goes into action. I love the Lord, but I'm not going to give any money to his cause. There's something wrong with the kind of love that doesn't lead to an action, a response. There's something wrong with the kind of love that doesn't lead to action. I love my wife, but I won't ever take her out to dinner or help her around the house or even listen to what she has to say. Something wrong with that kind of love. Oh, I love my neighbor, but I won't ever loan him my lawnmower or any of my tools. Genuine love always leads to action. I've heard a new definition of love recently. It's one of my favorites. And here it is. Love is a man carrying two umbrellas. You have to use your imagination to kind of get the picture. Why on earth would a man carry two umbrellas? 
even when it's raining like some of those monsoon storms we get, or we seem to be getting much better in the winter, <laughs> fall and winter, than we got in the monsoon season, at least in my house. Why two umbrellas? It doesn't make sense. How can you carry two umbrellas at once? You kind of have to hold them like here and here, and then right where they come together would funnel all the water right on top of it. And it would leak worse than with one. Two umbrellas don't make sense unless you plan to give one away. The man with two umbrellas can't possibly use more than one. The love in which our society steeps itself today is, I love you, brother. I sure hope you stay dry. Christian love says, here's an umbrella. Love in action. Love must become specific. Love must lead to action before we know whether or not it's genuine. John says in 1 John 2 verse 4, he says, If we claim that we know him and yet don't keep his commandments, we are liars. We're all mixed up on what love really is. Now you must love Christ to keep his commandments, but you must love his commandments and keep his commandments to know that you truly love him. And this is one reason God gave us the Ten Commandments, to let us know, is your love genuine? Is it genuine? The second reason is to keep us from hurting ourselves and others. The Ten Commandments keep us from hurting others. A friend of mine in college, Floyd, assisted in surgery one time and he was so excited. He was an orderly about halfway through college working in a hospital during the summertime. And he worked quite a little bit with one particular patient and the attending orthopedic surgeon. This man's break in his leg just wasn't healing. And so they had to take him in for a bone graft. The doctor said that Floyd could help. And so he scrubbed himself down thoroughly. And then he got on a sterile gown and he got on his sterile shoes and his sterile hat and his sterile gloves and he was now ready to operate. Well, actually, what the doctor wanted Floyd to do was to simply hold the leg while the nurse washed it. But it was a broken leg, a badly broken leg, and he took his part very seriously and so he held that leg very, very tenderly his first time in surgery, helping out. So excited. But one of his hands was kind of in the way as the nurse was doing the scrubbing. And so he pulled his hand down just a little bit further to give her access. And the doctor yelled out, No! Floyd, that's all we can use you for. You may leave. Your hand is a hand that is no longer sterile. You're excused. Poor Floyd was devastated. That dirty doctor. Why did he have to be so mean? You see, they were there in surgery trying to help that patient. And the only way they could help that patient was to obey the law that says you have to keep a sterile environment. If they broke the law, they hurt him. If they kept the law, they could help him. And that's the way it is with the Ten Commandments. God gave us that law, not to be arbitrary or mean to us, but to see that we don't hurt people. Take the Seventh Commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. Does God still believe in that clear down here in these days of modern contraception? God gave us the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, because adultery invariably hurts somebody. It hurts your partner or it hurts your spouse, or it hurts your child, or it hurts your parents and your family. God says don't commit adultery because it hurts someone. And God gives us the commandments to help us refrain from hurting others. Now he gave us the commandments not only to keep us from hurting others, but to keep from hurting ourselves. We must understand that breaking the commandments always breaks relationships. You cannot have a warm, vibrant, healthy relationship either with God or with man if you insist on breaking the commandments. 
Let's go back to the example of adultery again. He commits adultery. He's sorry. He's ashamed. He wants to start a new beginning. And he may even make a brand new dedication to the Lord. And he says to his wife, forgive me. She says, I forgive you. But every time he stays out late for whatever reason, she's got red eyes when he gets home. Why can't she ever forget? He comes to the pastor years later. She doesn't trust me. Well, it's hard to trust a person who has lied to you. Forgiveness, the most genuine forgiveness, it can happen in a moment. But trust is something that's got to be built. And if trust has been betrayed, it takes a long time to rebuild. You can't break the commandments without ruining relationships. You tell a lie. Our young people, especially when they get to be teenagers, you know, they tell their folks a lie. Pretty soon they find the folks aren't trusting them very much, and they get frustrated, and their thinking gets twisted, and they say, well, my parents don't trust me because they don't love me. No, they don't trust you because you lied to them, and they don't know just what kind of a fool you're making of them. Breaking the commandments ruins relationships, and God gave us the commandments to keep us from hurting ourselves and to keep us from hurting others. Third reason. Turn, if you will, to the book of James, the first chapter of the book of James. Way back in the back of the Bible, the book of James. The first chapter. God gave us the Ten Commandments to keep us from guilt, especially from the condemning kind of guilt. James 1, verse 25. James 1, 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. He talks here about the law as being a law of liberty. In what way is the Ten Commandment law a law of liberty? Well, it brings us freedom from sin. It brings us freedom from guilt. May I suggest this morning two kinds of guilt. First of all, there is condemning guilt. The condemning kind of guilt comes always and only from the devil. We go around feeling guilty because we didn't become what father and mother wanted us to be. We go around feeling guilty because we didn't do a perfect job of raising our children. We go around feeling guilty about a thousand things that we did yesterday that we can do nothing about today. That's condemning guilt. It's devil's guilt. So the psychologist didn't take very long to understand that this wasn't good for people to live with all that guilt. And so he said, no guilt. We don't want any absolutes, no standards in society because we must not have guilt. And now we've lived in a few generations that prove that without guilt, without standards, without law, without respect for law, you cannot have a functioning society. But there is another and a different kind of guilt, and that's convicting guilt. The Ten Commandments free us from guilt because we look at what's in the Ten Commandments, and if what we're feeling guilty about isn't there, we can just forget about it. We can just let it go. The only thing I need to feel guilty about is what is written in the Ten Commandments, and if it's in the Ten Commandments, then the Christ who gave them will use his strength to help me keep them. So the commandments help free me from guilt. John, the third chapter in the 17th verse, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. In verse 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned. Jesus frees us from the condemnation of sin. Condemning guilt is never Christian guilt. Convicting guilt is Christian guilt. Christ never makes you feel guilty about anything that he cannot save you from. 
The fourth reason I would suggest why God gave us the Ten Commandments is to convince a sinner that he needs a Savior. Galatians, the third chapter. We're going to turn back just a little bit from, if you're, if you're still at James, uh, back just a little bit to the book of Galatians. Galatians, the third chapter. Galatians, the third chapter, the 24th verse. Galatians 3, verse 24. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now the schoolmaster here is not what most of us probably picture, or is, is not what many of us picture as the teacher. The schoolmaster here is the servant who brought the children to the teacher. That's what it's actually referring to in the original language. The law is the servant of Christ who brings us to Christ. Without the law, I would not have known sin. Without sin, I would have no need of a feel, no need of a savior. And so the law brings me to Jesus. And so what we're saying this morning is that God gave us the law for four reasons. Number one, to keep us from hurting ourselves or others. Secondly, to protect us from the devil's condemning guilt. Thirdly, to bring us to the Savior. And then to show us what love is. Now, if it's true that the Ten Commandments show us what love is, then today let's study the first two commandments with that idea in mind. And so would you turn now with me to the book of Exodus, the 20th chapter. Exodus chapter 20. And we'll first look at the very first commandment. And what we're looking for today in this commandment, in these two commandments, and for all ten of these commandments, is how these commandments show us better what love is. From the first commandment, I believe we learn that love is putting God first. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Notice those words, before me. Nothing comes before God. Life really has meaning only when God is at the center of our lives. Imagine with me, if you will, a wagon wheel. We've all seen the wagon wheels. And you have a hub, and then you have all the spokes radiating out to the rim. God is the hub. He's at the center of our lives. Everything else, family relationships, work, hobbies, everything else that we do in our lives, those are all the spokes that come out, that are all part of our lives. Those are the spokes of the wheel. But God is at the center. Now, I hope you don't misunderstand me, but I would like to suggest that a wheel, a wagon wheel, is not just a hub without spokes. Because God doesn't want to be everything. He wants to be the center, but he, he doesn't just say you have to be only, like only in church. We have lives that we live, and God understands that. We have other relationships. We have other activities, hobbies, work that we have to do. And so God is at the center, is the most important part of our lives. But God doesn't want to have a relationship with you so close that you don't need a relationship with anybody else. And this, it seems to me, is one of the sure signs of fanaticism. Oh, I'm so close to God that I look down on everybody else, that I have no time for anyone else or anything else. You know, you've heard the saying that a person is so heavenly minded that there are no earthly good. Or they're so focused on the spiritual that they don't use that relationship, that strong, God-centered relationship to go and touch other people and make a difference in their families and in their communities and in their church. A relationship with God is no substitute for a relationship with your fellow man. 
And if your relationship with God separates you from your relationship with your fellow man, then you know it's not the real thing. It's impossible to get so close to God that it separates you from your fellow man. And so God is the hub. Not the whole wheel, but he's the hub. He's the center. The hub is the thing to which all of the spokes are fastened. Now a lot of us want to have a God who's one of the spokes. He's one of my interests in life. One interest among many. He's just one of those spokes. I need him in time of emergency. I need him to handle everything that I cannot handle. And then everything else, I just want to have control over all the other parts of my life. But a wheel cannot operate, a wheel can operate without one of those spokes, but a wheel cannot operate without a hub, without that central point. <coughs> When God is at the center and everything else is strengthened because he is in the center of our lives, then life begins to make sense. We become a whole person, a complete person. Notice again our text. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, only one God. Did you ever stop to think that God is not just sounding jealous here? God is trying to simplify life for us here. When you have only one God to serve, it takes the stress out of living. You see, when these words were spoken from Mount Sinai, they were spoken in a polytheistic world. Where there were gods everywhere. They had just come from Egypt, where they had many, many, many gods for everything. There was a God of vegetation, there was a God of fertility, there was a God of death, there was a God of war, there was a God of rain. And the moment that you got through appeasing one God, you had to dash up and appease another God, and behind your back the third God begins to get riled up. And so it was perpetual, running round and round in circles, trying to play please the gods, trying to appease the gods. And God said, hold it. There's only one God. There's only one God. And life hasn't changed very much, has it? We have so many irons in the fire. There's so many people to please. We have to please our family. We've got to please our friends. We've got to please our boss. We've got to please everybody. No, there's only one God. And when your basic purpose in life is just to please the one God, then you don't live in a perpetual frustration about this and that and something else going wrong. If God is again at the center, if our lives are dedicated to serving and pleasing Him, then everything else will come out all right. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. The second commandment now says that love is worshiping God, not just our representation of God. Exodus 20, verses 4 to 6. Exodus 20, verses 4 to 6. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. That third and fourth generation part. Now, idolatry is simply the worship of things. Have you ever stopped to think that maybe you and your family are setting a thing-centered pattern that will not die out in your family for three or four generations? Did you ever stop to think that your parents and your family back behind you somewhere have set that kind of tradition that affects you today? It takes a long time for a thing-centered tradition, the commandment says, to pass out of the family. Let's take a look at verse 6 again showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. In this passage, the King James Version and most other ones leaves out the word generations. But that word is implied here. If you look at Deuteronomy 7 verse 9, Deuteronomy simply means repetition of the law. That's what Deuteronomy means. It's of Moses' law being repeated to the children of Israel. 
after their wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. But in Deuteronomy 7, verse 9, it says, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him, and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. So when the law was repeated, that word is in there. Here back in Exodus 20, newer editions of the NIV include the word generations in that passage. Showing mercy unto a thousand generations of them that love me and keep my commandments. Isn't that a beautiful promise? The results of sin may last three or four generations. But the results of love and righteousness last a thousand generations. Now in this second commandment, God is saying, don't worship images. And we kind of get off on this pretty easily as Protestants, as Adventists. But I'd like to be a little bit hard on us because I want to make sure that we understand that all of these commandments apply to each one of us. May I suggest that he's saying here, don't worship your human image of God. I want to ask you a personal question. When you pray, what picture of God comes to mind? Like, what are you praying to? What is your picture of who you're praying to? When you kneel down all by your lonesome and you're pouring out your heart to God, what picture of God do you see? A kindergarten teacher told everyone in class to draw a picture of what was important to them. In the back of the room, Johnny began to labor over his drawing. Everybody else finished, they handed in their picture to the teacher, but he didn't. He was still drawn. The teacher graciously walked back, put her arm around Johnny's shoulder, and said, Johnny, what are you drawing? He didn't look up. He just kept on working feverishly at his picture. He said, God. But Johnny, she said gently, no one knows what God looks like. He answered, They will when I'm through. (laughs) What does your God look like? Does he maybe look like your grandfather, the one who gives you presents and is somewhat blind to your faults? Does he look like your father who's always telling you what to do? Does he look like that traffic court judge who seems always ready to pounce on your mistakes? Or does he look more like the artist's concept, a king with a crown and a marble throne, royal, majestic, but rather unapproachable? Now our teeny tiny minds need images in order to grasp the concept of God. But the thing is, we must be very, very careful that we don't take these images so seriously that we wind up worshiping our picture of God because it is a terribly imperfect and awfully inaccurate picture. May I suggest that if we want a perfectly accurate picture of God, we study the life of Jesus Christ. John 14, verse 9 says, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. That's the image of God that he wants us to have. Jesus came to reveal what God looks like, what his character is like. Now, don't waste your love on a God that can't love you back. Why does God say don't waste your time on gods of wood and stone? Because God doesn't want us to waste our love. Don't waste your love on a house. Don't waste your love on a car. Don't waste your love on an iPhone. Don't waste your love on something that cannot love you back. When you give your love to God, then your love is returned a thousandfold with a saving, everlasting love. God wants you to worship Him because He wants you to worship something and to love some, to love something that can love you back. And so God gave us the commandments to show us what love is. And as we have taken a very quick look at these first two commandments, we find that love is putting God first. As we close our worship this morning, oh, how much I wish that every one of us, myself included, would take just one quiet moment and ask ourselves, do I really put God first in my life?
When it comes time for family or private devotions and we say that we don't have time, the thing that we do instead is really our first God. And God is not at the top of the list. He's not at the center of our lives. If you're not finding time for God, God is not at the center of your life. He may just be one of those many spokes in your life, but he's not at the center. He's not at the hub. God is not number one if you're finding time for everything else but God. Now, I'm not much of an astronomer, but I'm inclined to think that there's nothing like a little look at the heavens to help us appreciate the bigness of God. I think that's where David was when he penned Psalm 8, verses 3 and 4. He said, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? I can walk out on my yard on a late Sabbath afternoon and watch the sun set over the Wachuca Mountains. And so often with our Arizona sunsets, God splashes the sky with bright colors, yellows, pinks, oranges, purples, reds, constantly changing. We have some of the most beautiful sunsets. Yeah. And then gradually the light fades, and I see the moon beginning to come through. And finally as darkness falls, the brightest, biggest star, and then another, and then another, and then a thousand, and then ten thousand poke their quivering heads through that blanket of night. <coughs> they tell me that most of those are suns out there, countless billions of them. Many much larger than our sun, just pulsating with energy. Now it's almost impossible for our finite minds to grasp the immensity of the universe, just like we can't comprehend the power of God, the omniscience of God, the omnipresence of God. Our minds just can't really grasp that. But let me, for just a couple of moments, try to get us a bit of a perspective on just how vast the universe is. If our solar system were the size of a quarter, just as the whole solar system, just the sun and all the planets, asteroids around it, if the solar system were the size of a quarter, our sun would be a microscopic speck of dust, hardly visible on the quarter, as big as the sun is. The nearest sun to our solar system is Proxima Centauri. That would be two football fields away from this quarter. Long ways away. If our fastest spaceship were to head towards that nearest sun, it would take 70,000 years to get there. The diameter of the Milky Way our galaxy would be the size of the United States compared to this quarter of our solar system. The Milky Way, our galaxy, is so big that, that even at the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles per second, or 6 trillion miles per year, if you traveled at that speed, the speed of light, it would take 100,000 years to cross our galaxy. That's just our galaxy. And now as the telescopes, the Hubble telescope in particular, and other powerful telescopes have shown us that scientists now believe that there are billions of galaxies in our solar system. That translates into more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on every beach and every desert in all of planet Earth. More stars than that. And that's just what we think. And all the time, as we learn more, it seems to be even bigger than that. And when I look up at that night sky, and I imagine all of that power out there. 
And I imagine all of that limitless space and bigness out there. And I realize all of the perfect order out there, that all of these things exist with perfect order. Then it's easy for me to see that the God who does that is much too big to take second place in the life of this tiny mortal. Love is putting God first. Our closing hymn, number 458. More love.